Good afternoon, everyone. Bienvenidos todos. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Amazingly, this is my 14th State of the City Address. As always, I want to express deep appreciation to my fellow counselors, to our city staff, and to all of our residents who are watching this on our CLC TV cable channel, YouTube, or who are viewing this event online. I want to welcome and thank my wife and First Lady Rosie Miyagashima, likewise listening at home for her steadfast love and support. I would also like to pause for a moment to bring to mind all those that we have lost in the COVID pandemic this year. Those who continue to suffer with health problems from the virus and all those who grieve for their family members, friends and neighbors. So please a moment of silence. Thank you. I'm speaking to you today at a distance due to COVID-19 pandemic that we've been experiencing for the past 12 months, a year that has been as challenging as any I can remember. No community could have been fully prepared for what we have lived through or the challenges that we have faced. The people we have lost, the disruption of almost every kind of public activity, the reformulation of our schooling and commerce, and the devastating effect on our local businesses would have been impossible to imagine a year ago. Everything has been a challenge for the city, no less than for other institutions and for all of us in our daily lives. Thankfully, due to the council's careful financial stewardship over the many years, to the focus, teamwork, and dedication of our city staff, and most of all, to the courage and the character of the people who live here, I can announce that the state of our city is strong. The COVID pandemic was sudden and fast moving. Our local goals focused at first on the immediate, keeping our hospitals and medical workers from being overwhelmed and adopting measures to keep the virus in check, like social distancing and wearing of masks. Over time, strategies for detecting and defeating the coronavirus have been worked out by our nation's scientists and medical experts and implemented by growing confidence and commitment by the people of our community. From the beginning, the city council and staff did everything we could think of to help our residents, support our medical op uh, workers and make sure everyone had something to eat and some place to live. I tried my best to harmonize emergency guidelines with medical consensus, the best thinking of my fellow council members and mandates from the state. Working with area nonprofits, the council authorized approximately $3 million in city funds for COVID related needs, working directly and through area nonprofits to provide food, rent, mortgage, utility and medical assistance for area residents. The food was distributed to children and seniors and through food vouchers to low income individuals and families. Grants extended to nonprofits allowed them to continue their services to children, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault and other vulnerable members of the community. Face masks made locally were distributed to area medical centers and 75,000 masks were mailed along with utility bills to nearly 40,000 households. Thanks to these efforts and so many other contributions from community members, local businesses and nonprofits, our community has been able to find its way through this difficult period. Now through the development and distribution of effective vaccines, we can imagine moving over the next few months into a more normal life. Obviously there's been a tremendous loss in terms of, of lives lost, plans disrupted and businesses and jobs that may not return. There is sorrow in the hearts of so many that only slowly will be lifted. Hopefully it is of some comfort to know that we stayed together as a community and have continued to reach out and help one another to this very day. Many of us were able to do our part by simply following health directives, staying at home, avoiding unnecessary public activity and keeping others safe by wearing our mask. 
Many others helped by staying and working from home. This cooperation saved lives in our city. Ironically, it was this time of personal isolation that we became most acutely aware of our many neighbors who could not stay home, like the healthcare workers who moved each day through the heart of the pandemic, our doctors and nurses certainly, but also our many medical technicians, custodians, kitchen workers, and support staff that courageously showed up every day to keep vital facilities open and safe. We quickly realized our daily reliance on our grocery and retail workers, our truck drivers and delivery people, our children and elderly care workers, all those who left the safety of their own homes to provide essential services for the rest of us. I know many parents carrying over their children's shoulders at a computer or tablet, marveled anew at the energy, adaptability, and the deep caring of those who teach our children, wondering what would we ever do without them? Our public safety officers faithfully answered calls, adding uncertainty and risk to an already risky job. For a society that cherishes its independence as much as we do, and prizes the freedom to do what we please. It can be a jolt to realize how much that very independence is self-dependent on the kindness, strength, and service of those around us. It's important realization to have and one that we have now gained. I'll have to say that I think that we have as Las Cruces a head start in that realization and understanding. We have long understood the intrinsic worth of every individual in our community and the important roles that we play in one another's lives. We've long known, as President Biden said in his inaugural address, there are some days we need a hand and other days when we're called on to give one. Seldom though have we comforted, confronted this truth so directly as we have over the last 12 months, or with as clear a recognition that many of our essential workers have been giving back far more than they have been accustomed to receive. That understanding informs many of my remarks today. We want everyone in our city to be safe in our homes and neighborhoods, to experience prosperity and the opportunity to fulfill ourselves, to enjoy a secure and stable platform to encounter the world. At the same time, we have become more fully aware, acknowledged or not, of a growing divide between those with the means to have these things in abundance and those who do not. Many who do not are the same people who have given so much of themselves in the course of this pandemic. To increase our residents' financial resources, we engage in economic development, including attracting new businesses. We have also increasingly dedicated ourselves to improved educational opportunities and workforce development so that we have the skills needed to prosper in a fast changing economy. These are both important endeavors. What I'd like to talk about today is a third element that I think is important. A point that our current counselors have emphasized again and again. The opportunity for us to look beyond a role of workers toward building our own base of personal and family wealth. For that reason, I recently asked that our new strategic plan call on the Economic Development Department to develop a component dedicated to local wealth creation. One task of this initiative would be to help local entrepreneurs start or expand their own enterprises, especially those that produce goods and services that we are currently buying somewhere else. We wanna provide our businesses better access to local capital. These businesses can in turn become vehicles for job creation and economic growth. As money circulates within our own community, both wages and profits stay here. Importantly, all of us who are workers can be owners ourselves, if not in the workplace, then, then in our personal lives. We need to share financial literacy and wealth building principles widely with our residents and to actively expand opportunities for home ownership, which builds not just family wealth, but neighborhood stability, itself a long-term investment in our future. We can assist in this process by creating, whether in targeted areas or throughout the city, zoning that allows a wider variety of housing options, including duplexes, 
triplexes and accessory buildings. Units that permit homeowners to build capital through rental and other neighborhood level entrepreneurial activities. Creating local wealth leads to the intergenerational transfer of wealth within our community, helping our children gain a financial foothold in their own lives. We need to open the doors of prosperity to all of our residents so that building wealth is an activity of the many and not just a few. Nowhere are the barrier, barriers to personal and family security more visible than in the lack of quality housing options our residents can afford. The median price of a, of a new single family house sold in Las Cruces in January of this year, according to the Las Cruces Sun News, was over a quarter of a million dollars, a price out of reach for, major, for the majority of our residents. A lack of affordable housing options is reflected in the rental market as well, where it's not unusual for residents to pay over half of their income for a place to live. That the situation is worse in other places is small consolation. Our health, success, and harmony as friends and neighbors are absolutely dependent on our creating better housing choices for the full range of residents in our community. This shared necessity has led to a number of steps the city has taken and some additional perspectives I'd like to share. Last year, I talked with you about the development of city-owned property along East Loman, across from the Mountain View Medical Complex. It would have been easy to sell that land off to a developer for higher-end single-family homes, but that sector of the housing economy is doing fine. Instead, we engaged a master planning consultant and worked with the public to envision a mixed use residential and commercial district to include not just single family homes, but properties designed to serve what has come to be known nationally as the missing middle. Housing affordable to buyers and renters of more modest incomes, many of whom are the same people who've served us so selflessly over the last 12 months. We believe private developers and builders will find increasing value in serving this market. But for the time being, we can make sure that developments that occur on land owned by the public entity, like the city or the state land office, or that are subsidized in any way by a taxpayer, include plenty of well-designed, attractive, energy efficient homes affordable to a wider range of our residents. One area of particular opportunity for mixed income housing lies in infill areas where we already have infrastructure in place, including access to parks, schools, and existing commercial areas. Last year, when I talked about the El Paseo Corridor, I don't think I yet appreciated the key role that housing could play in its development through leveraging public-private partnerships to develop vacant land and large underused parking lots in the wide variety of housing types so highly in demand by millennials, students, and workers, as well as individuals and families of all types who are increasingly attracted to smaller properties in a walkable and transit friendly environment. Commercial development will follow people back into these urban centers. Frequent transit service will become more cost effective and we will find ourselves with the vibrant corridor that we have long imagined, connecting our great state university with a vibrant downtown. The broader value of infill development has not escaped the El Paseo Solano Corridors Task Force chaired by Councillor Gabe Vasquez. They have recently expanded their focus beyond Solano to include surrounding neighborhoods, stretching south to University and east to Trevis. This area represents a tremendous resource for the city of Las Cruces. It has been cultivated by the council for well over a decade as we have continued to invest in the health and safety and attractiveness of traditional neighborhoods. From our ambitious street maintenance program to improvements for local parks, to our support of community schools as educational and community centers for neighborhood residents. We wanna make sure that these areas remain safe, healthy, and prosperous. In the process, we are acting as responsible stewards for the, fat, for the vast reserve of middle income housing that already exists within established neighborhoods already served by public infrastructure. Additionally, these neighborhoods provide abundant opportunities for infill housing, especially for smaller units and the variety of wealth building housing types that we referred to earlier. 
the duplexes, townhouses, and in-law type accessory housing that a generation ago were widely available to moderate income residents. As we move forward, the city may want to be more proactive in public-private partnerships securing these infill properties, both large and small, as they become available in order to work with private and nonprofit builders and developers to create real home affordability, quality, and choice for the people of our community. A revitalized downtown, vibrant city corridors, healthy and steadily renewing existing neighborhoods, these are the ways that we will avoid a problem that so many growing cities have experienced, a donut-like growth pattern that features a circle of newer, well-appointed neighborhoods around a hollowed out core. We're not gonna let that happen here. With that shared resolution and commitment, there are a few things I would like to touch on today. Last year, in the State of the City Address, I talked about the creation of a behavioral health district in our area. Though slowed somewhat by COVID and the many pressing needs it created in our community, we are still fully committed to the better coordinating the behavioral health efforts of the county, city, public schools, and area municipalities. In addition to her leadership on a wide variety of behavioral health issues, Mayor Pro Tem Cassandra Gantara has continued to move this initiative forward and hopefully we will get it done this year. Notably too, in the past year, our events that have brought about a deep reconsideration of our nation's troubled racial history, a long delayed acknowledgement of the personal and systemic mistreatment suffered by many of our neighbors. I, like people of goodwill, welcome this conversation as a necessary part of our journey to ever deeper ties to community and mutual respect. Much of this the discussion nationally has focused on policing. Naturally, I feel we're a little head on the issue as well, since our police force has long reflected the makeup of the larger community and our public safety officers live among us as neighbors and friends. Still, we can benefit greatly from a wide ranging consideration of best practices for modern public safety. We welcome the opportunity to participate in what is evolving into a thorough examination of how we can best serve the public. This will likely include the development of specialized roles and procedures better to address behavioral health, addiction related crises, domestic violence, and our homeless and transient population. We have already begun these conversations internally, and we have every confidence that our new police chief will engage with council, city staff, and the rest of the community to make Las Cruces Police Department one of the best trained and most professional forces in the country with strong culture for respect for all. Chief Dominguez, for our part, we pledge to work closely with you and your department to secure the resources that you need to get this done. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the progress that we've made as a city in terms of, state, in terms of sustainability and resilience, especially as we, along with the rest of the world, become ever more aware of the serious challenge posed by changing climate. In some ways, the climate crisis presents an opportunity similar to what we encounter in public safety, a thorough rethinking of the way we have been accustomed to doing things. In both cases, it's easy to see how quickly a society can be humbled by sudden awakenings and the clear importance of proactivity and sustainable practices going forward. In the area of climate, I would like to think we're also a little ahead of the game uh, with our early hiring of the sustainability officer but the rest of, the, of our society and economy are catching up. It's hard to even imagine the changes in energy generation and usage that will be a part of in the coming years. I would like to keep our advantage if we can, and that's why I'm hopeful that our sustainability officer can use her experience and extended knowledge base to help our departments move forward with all due speed toward a low carbon, less costly future for the city and its residents. So in spite of the COVID crisis and in some respects because of it, we continue to move forward with resolve and a growing sense of confidence. Over the past year, we have stabilized ourselves administratively. Of special significance is the hiring of our new city manager, Ifo Pili. We lost our previous city manager just before the pandemic began and all levels of city management performed admirably in the interim. 
I especially want to thank retired interim city manager, David Maestas for a job well done. It's good to have Ifo here at the helm. He has been consistently insightful and responsive to the council. His calm voice of reason, helping him ground the decisions that we make. For all of these reasons and many others, the state of our city is strong. In the face of adversity, we have come together powerfully as a community with renewed purpose and eagerness for the future. We understand even more clearly our deep dependence on one another. We are as committed as ever to making this place the best possible for all of us to live. I commend our hardworking city councilors among the most dedicated public servants I have ever known. They join me in our appreciation of staff for their dedication to our mission, creative thinking and daily service. We are thankful for every one of you in this special community. Personally, I'm especially grateful to share this precious life with you and the opportunity to serve as your mayor. Thank you.